You, here's the thing. When we get to the place where we're spirit-filled, we're not looking for excuses. They don't exist. No excuses. You make up your mind, I'm not going to do anything but what the Lord says it's okay. Psalm chapter 85. What a joy to be here this week. I have been blessed. My wife and I have enjoyed the fellowship with the pastor and his wife and of course the staff and many of you and got to eat out with some of you. And thank you for the vehicle that I was able to drive, Brother Elias. Hallelujah. That was wonderful. And uh, I just thank, thank all of you for being faithful to the services. We can have revival. I don't care what anybody says. Uh, the Bible makes it clear uh, that, uh, well, it's right in our text here in Psalm chapter 85, look at verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again and again and again that thy people may rejoice in thee? You can have revival in your lifetime, and I'm going to preach this evening on having revival in your lifetime. I want to also thank the church for supporting us. Our picture's over here, and every month uh, they support us. You people support us and help us go from church to church representing Christ. And uh, I am grateful for uh, your love for us. And it just thrills me to be here, and I thank the Lord for, for uh, British Columbia. Wow, what a mission field, amen? And you're right in the middle of it. If we want to see our cities change, it's going to have to be a great deal of sowing the seed. We've got to get the seed out of the barn, the Bible says. We must canvas the city and reach every soul right now. If the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in five years, you've got five years left to reach this city. If he comes back next month, you've got 30 days. How important it is for us to speak the truth and love people unconditionally and bring this next generation to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It changed you, didn't it? Well, it can change them. And that's what we pray for. Can we see revival in our lifetime? The Lord gave me that thought when I was reading this passage of Scripture. And tonight I want to preach on that subject. Can we have revival in our lifetime? Now some of you have many years ahead of you, if the Lord tarries. Some of you have not so many and uh, we have got to work toward seeing revival. Now, I'm going to tell you something that happened to me when I was a pastor. I'd been pastoring for 10 years. And a preacher, a young preacher like myself, called me and said, Hey, would you come and preach a revival? Well, I'd never preached a revival before. I'd never seen a revival. And I got there on Wednesday night and I preached and Thursday night I preached and oh, I told my wife, Anne Marie, that was terrible. I, I, I can't preach a revival. I've never even seen a revival. I'm not qualified. I said, I'm going to get alone this afternoon and I went down to the beach there in Newport, Rhode Island, it was freezing cold. I took an Afghan out of the van and put it around me. I must have looked like a sight, let me tell you. And I walked the beach. It was cold. And I said, oh God, I can't do this. I can't do this. Unless you get into this next service, I'd really like to go home. I felt out of place. I got up and preached, and heaven came down in that meeting. I am not kidding. It was something that God did. I can't take any credit for it because God did it. 
That's what I like about revival. If anything comes out of this meeting, God did it, not Dan Knickerbocker. I preached on we don't practice what we preach. We harbor secret sin. God's going to expose our sin unless we confess it. When I came to the close of the invitation, or to the invitation, I said, well, I was going to say, just have a regular invitation. And the Holy Spirit said, you're going to do it different tonight. Mm, okay, I'm listening. He said, you tell these people to stand up and start confessing their sins publicly. You go over and kneel at this chair over here, and you pray. I preached 40 minutes. We had a 45-minute time of people confessing their sin publicly. The Bible says, confess your faults one to another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And I am blown away by it, Pastor. I'm not kidding. I, the pastor must have been scared. He was sitting down there. What has he just done? People are going to stand up and start confessing their faults. That could cause gossip. Who knows what could come out of that? But God was in it. And people started standing up and they said, you know, I'm not where I should be spiritually. One woman got up and said, I've been treating all of you women in the church miserably because I'm miserable. And I'm sorry and I want you ladies to forgive me. They started moving out of their chairs and they came over to her and they hugged her neck and said, we're praying for you and we're so, we love you and we, we're glad that God spoke to you tonight and you made that confession. And I, I just can't take the time right now to tell you of all the testimonials, but it was amazing. I've seen it. And I told the Lord after that meeting, it was a four-day meeting, it turned into a 10-day meeting. These people did not want to stop the meeting. In fact, I had preaching videos with me and people wanted to hang around and we'd listen to two or three videos after the service in the fellowship hall and leave the church at about 11 o'clock 12 o'clock midnight one lady spent the whole night at the altar i never seen anything like it and i said to the lord now lord i'm happy being a pastor but if you'd ever let me be an evangelist, I'd love to do that. Ten years later, God called me to do what I'm doing now. And he's the only one that can make it work. In fact, I stand before you saying, Lord, in spite of me, bless this meeting. Help me, God, to be pure and clean in your sight. That the power of God would rest upon this church and that everyone here would be thoroughly right with God. So let's take a journey on experiencing revival in our lifetime. Psalm chapter 85, we're going to move quickly tonight because I have a lot of ground to cover. You'll notice in verse 1 of chapter 85, the words, Lord, thou hast what? Underline those three words, thou hast been. Thou hast been favorable, verse 1. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity, verse 2. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath, verse 3. Turn thyself from the fierceness of thine anger, verse 3. And then he says, Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to what? Cease. God cannot be angry with his people that are right with him. The Bible says God's angry with the wicked every day. And when we're in iniquity, God is angry with us. Because don't we know better? We do know better, don't we? 
Now watch this. Go with me, if you would, to verse 5. Look at these two words, wilt thou. Underline those words, wilt thou. He asked the question, wilt thou be angry with us forever? Verse 5. Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Verse 5. Verse 6, wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may what? Rejoice in the happy Christians is what this world needs. Then we notice the last phrase found in verses 7 to 13. Yea, the Lord what? Shall. The Lord shall. Look at verse 7. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what the Lord, the God, the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to what? Folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in them. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Here it is. Yea, the Lord shall. What shall he do? He'll give that which is good and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of whose steps? His steps. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Did you know the Bible talks a lot about being in a race? If we're going to see revival, we've got to qualify to be in the race. I was preaching in New York City and a lady and two men came forward to get saved at their 25th anniversary service. After they got saved, one of them came up to me after the service and he said, do you know why I got saved today? I said, why? He says, it's because of what you said to me. I said, what did I say? He said that the only way you can be saved is you have to qualify. And then you said... In order to qualify to be saved, you have to be a sinner. He said, you know, I've never liked going to church. I've always felt uncomfortable in church. Because of my sin. How could God like it if I come to church? And he told me, he said... I discovered when you were preaching that Jesus loves me as a sinner and wants to save me. And I had to be a sinner to get saved. He said, I'm in. And he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to tell all my friends that they qualify. <laughs> Why don't you try that on your friends? Say, hey, would you like to... Would you like to qualify to be saved? He said, well, I don't know whether I could or not. Oh, yeah, you can. The only way you can qualify is you have to be a sinner. And I know you're a sinner. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, haven't we? Now, in relation to this race, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Let us run the race with patience, that is set before us. In 1 Corinthians 9.24 it says, They which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. If we want to have revival, we can have it. But we have to run the race. We have to live the life of a Christian in every way. We can't take any shortcuts. We have to do exactly what God has given us to do. Perfect example in James chapter 5 verse 7. 
Paul's speaking to the Galatians. He says, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? You were running good until you started accepting lies. And then they got mad at Paul. He said, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? Your best friend will tell you you have bad breath. Amen. And your best friend will tell you you need to get right with God. And that's what God's asking us to qualify in this race to experience revival. Philippians chapter 2 verse 16, the Bible says, Hold forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. I'm coming to the ending of my ministry. I don't know how many more years I have. I got a blood clot in my leg in 2013. It went up into my heart, came out into my lungs. The doctor said, somebody's really looking out after you. And I said, yeah, I know him. His name is Jesus Christ. And I preached to everybody that I, that I came my way when I was in the hospital. Amen. About a month and a half, no, a month and a half ago, I had a, uh, I had a, a mini stroke on the, on the right side. It lasted about 15 minutes and then it went away and it hasn't come back. I don't know how long I have. But I can tell you one thing. I can see revival until I die. And I wouldn't be on the road, my wife and I wouldn't be on the road if we didn't believe God could send revival to you. That's right. Now let's take a look at the three types of Christians we have here tonight. Now we talked about the natural man on Sunday, the spiritual man, and then we talked about the the carnal man. There are basically three types of believers. And this is something that you've really got to think about it and say, now, Lord, where do I fit in to this? Number one, would you write this down? Those that are deliberately rebellious against God and man. They're deliberately rebellious against God and against man. Now, how many of you sometimes are bullheaded? You like things your way. Sometimes you can't take rebukes very well. And a lot of times you're right on the edge spiritually. You're you're like one of these Christians that's doing one of these. Let's see how close I can get to the world without falling. Instead of getting back here where you know you won't fall. There are Christians that are playing with sin. They're deliberately rebellious against God. And they even get mad at people that are more spiritual than themselves. I'm going to prove it to you. When I went to Bible college, I, I was pretty, not wild, but I was, um, how can I say it? I was, I, I wasn't where I should be spiritually. I mean, I was called to preach. I love the Lord, but there were other students that I knew were more spiritual than me. And I didn't like them. One fellow's name was uh, David Worsham. And I used to think he just, he's, you know, he's a teacher's pet and, you know, he never does anything wrong. And I kind of had an attitude toward him. And God convicted me of it. And I went to him one day and I said, David, I appreciate your walk with God. I can see it in your life. There's a lot of Christians, you can't see the power of God in their life because they've got this spirit of rebellion. Have you ever had the feeling nobody's going to tell me what to do? I went to Texas to direct a Bible college and there were preachers that didn't like me 
because I was from Tennessee. And then I was a Yankee from New York. That's even worse. And I could tell those preachers didn't like me and they wanted nothing to do with the college because we Tennesseans came down to straighten out the Texans and you don't straighten out Texans. And so God put it on my heart to love the unlovely. You know what I'm talking about? If there's somebody that has an attitude or isn't interested in the things that you're doing for the Lord, uh, I, would, I would get them to really like me. Don't you think God works that way with us? Don't you think God wants us on his side? Don't you think God wants us to no longer be rebellious against Him or against anyone else? You can help people when you're submissive to God and you're walking with God and you're living for God and there's a joy that comes in you to the point where it becomes contagious. People begin to love you because they know how much you love the Lord. Isn't that what we need? My wife loves me so much more when she sees me loving God more than I love her. Does that make sense? When my wife is walking with God, I sense it. She's been a good wife all these 45 years. Never complain. Just Love God. Serve God. Let's do what God's called us to do. I love to be around people that have no rebellion in them at all. And they stay right with God. Well, this type of person's not that way. And if you'll go with me over to the book of Jeremiah quickly, I'm going to just read off a couple things out of chapter 16. I'm going to give you the verse, and then I'm just going to go through the verse. You can follow me. Jeremiah 16, verse 11, Fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord. The fathers have forsaken me, the Lord says. They're walking after other gods and they're serving them. All in verse 11. Worshipped, and they've forsaken me. They've not kept my laws. They disobey my laws. Verse 12. The children have done worse than the fathers. Uh Uh-oh. What family, what, what parents do in moderation, children do in excess. There's many Christian families that are hurting because their children and grandchildren are not following the Lord like they were following the Lord. You'll notice they've done worse than their fathers. They've had imaginations of an evil heart. They will not hearken unto me. Verse 13, I will cast you out of the lands because you're serving other gods. I will show you, I will not show you favor. In verse 14 of chapter 16, behold, the day will come when it will be said no more, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. There's going to come a day when nobody knows how great our God was. Boy, I feel like that sometimes in our own nation. There's a lack of respect for religion and for God. And Jesus Christ, they know how to use His name in vain, but they don't want anything to do with Jesus. That's the deliberately rebellious people against God. You say, boy, praise the Lord, I'm not in that, in that camp. I hope none of you are in that camp. I hope that none of you are deliberately rebellious against God or others. Number two, the second group we find are those that are decently right with God. Doesn't that sound so neat? You know, pastor, as long as I say decently right with God, I'm going to enjoy my Christian life. Well, I decided to look up that word decent. I didn't like what I read. Decent is defined as not drawing attention to what you're really like. Hmm. 
We're not always, we are, we're not always as good as we look. Could we agree on that one? Anybody can put on a show praying for you, and then you don't do it. How about that one? So often we are so, so self-absorbed that we don't want to get too involved with anybody because it might cost us something. And yet you expect your pastor to be right there for you if you need him. And rightly so. Thank God for pastors that have a heart for people and are willing to give instruction and guidance. Wonderful it is when men in the church can help other men to be closer to God. Women in fellowship with other women that can help them. Because all of us go through struggles. But I'd be a little afraid to just be decently right with God. I was in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico preaching. And this man came up to me. You could tell he was troubled. And he looked at me kind of funny and he said, are you like this all the time? I said, well, what do you mean? Well, you just seem so happy. Like that was something that was wrong. <laughs> and you know what I said to him? If I stay decently right with God, I'm happy. And I discovered that's not good enough. Is it? It's not good enough. I should always be striving to do better. I should never lose ground and get backslidden. Stop doing what I know God's commanded me to do. Many Christians lose ground. Sometimes the older they, they get, the slower they become spiritually. Oh, let the young people do it. Hold it. Aren't we supposed to serve the Lord all the days of our life? We gotta quit making excuses as to why we don't do what God's called us to do. You set an example for others. The older people set examples for younger people. You know how hard it is for a young person to live for God when they see older Christians falling away? What's the use? Why should I give of my life? Why should I go into the ministry? Why should I serve the Lord? If, if people that I respected have fallen, Paul feared that he would be a castaway. When I've preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. We can't get by being just decently right with God. That brings me to the third group. Oh, I love this. The third group are those that are definitely filled with the Holy Spirit power. This is the group every one of us should be striving for. I would like to give you a statement that I'd like you to write down, if you would. Would you write this down? Revival is an overwhelming presence of the Spirit of God in the life of the believer. I'll say it again. Revival is an overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit of God in the life of the believer. That right there ought to be our mission. I have got to get to the place in my life where I sense the divine presence of the Holy Spirit in my life to the point where whatever the Holy Spirit wants, I want. Whatever the Holy Spirit doesn't want in my life, it's gone. I'm going to get rid of it. Nothing's going to reign over me but God. 
That's where the happy people live. Amen? Happy, happy people, spirit-filled people are humble people. Humble. I'm nothing but a sinner saved by God's grace. Oh, it's so good to be in His presence because the Bible says in His presence is fullness of joy. At His right hand there are pleasures forevermore. By living the Christian life, we give Him pleasure. Can you imagine giving the Creator of the world pleasure? That sounds so cool. <laughs> I mean, that, that is like the neatest thing. When God called me to preach, I, did, I, I, I told my dad I wasn't going to be a preacher. I told you folks about this, didn't I? How many remember me telling you about that? Yeah. But as soon as I surrendered and said, Lord, if that's what you want me to be, I sensed his awesome presence in my life. And I knew that he was talking to me and that God Almighty who hangs the world on nothing wants me to be his preacher. I've never gotten over it. And I pray I never do. I was talking with a preacher one time and he said to me, yeah, he said, I picked up a side job. I'm tired of killing time between Sundays. <laughs> Figure that one out. I don't know about you, but when I was a pastor, pastor, I could never get it all done. <laughs> but I must say to you that God wants us to get what he wants done, not what we want done. I found that out. Because you can burn yourself out. But when you get to that place where the Holy Spirit is guiding you and leading you in every area of your life, it is the most exciting and thrilling thing because you know that God is the one that's in charge. And you read through your Bible. How many have ever read through your Bible? What's one of the things that bothers you more than anything else? Israel, right? God blessed them. They served other gods. You can't hardly find anybody in the Bible that lived a spirit-filled, powerful life for God. Even Jeremiah wanted to quit, you remember? But his bones burned within him. He could not stay. He had to keep following the Lord. And he was... He was ridiculed and he was mocked and he was thrown in a pit. But he never quit serving God. Are we afraid of persecution? Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer what? That's why a lot of Christians decide to be, well, let me just be decently right with God. I mean, I don't want to go overboard like some fanatics do. Well, I don't know about you, but I just watched the Super Bowl or a portion of it. You talk about fanatics? I wish we could find some fanatics in God's house. That's what I'd like to find. People that are absolutely on fire for the Lord and excited about it. Hey, I got a chance to witness this week. Somebody came to church because I invited them. You, here's the thing. When we get to the place where we're spirit-filled, we're not looking for excuses. They don't exist. No excuses. You make up your mind, I'm not going to do anything but what the Lord says it's okay. Whew. Any takers? Anybody say, yeah, I, I, I think I'd like to do that. Aren't you tired of your little rebellious life? Aren't you tired a little bit about being just decently right with God? When you know you could be so much more than you are right now? Guess what? It's your choice. God doesn't make anybody do anything. 
Now, sometimes he'll put circumstances in our life to bring us around. And maybe this meeting and this meeting tonight, maybe this is where God's really talking to you about a full surrender. The greatest thing you could ever do is fully surrender to God. You said, I did that one time, Lord. But is, is he as real and as powerful to you now as he was back when you really surrendered yourself to him? We get cold, don't we? We get status quo. Not going to do any more than I have to do. No, I'm only going to do what God wants me to do. That's what revival really is. And I believe that Dan Knickerbocker has seen revival. Many of you have seen a touch of revival. Why not go for it? And say, I'm going to spend the rest of my life on fire for God. I'm going to quit sin. Anything that's not right in my life, it's going to go. The pastor was talking about records. Boy, he didn't want to break those old nostalgic records until he broke one of them. And then he's breaking them one right after the other. It gets exciting. You know, years ago, people used to bring their dirty magazines. They bring their cigarettes. They bring their bring their beer to the altar, give it to God. Hey Amen. I was preaching in a church in Illinois, this young couple, sharp couple. I'm talking about full surrender, folks. I'm talking about filled with the Holy Spirit of God. This young couple, sharp couple, business people, they both came forward on Monday night. They're down there on their knees, him and his wife. They're probably, what, maybe 25? Sharply dressed, just gotten saved about a month earlier. Friday night, he comes up to me after the service and says, do you want to know why I came forward? My wife and I came forward Monday night. He had to tell me. I said, I saw you there, but I don't know why. He said, we gave up our pot We don't need that anymore. The Lord satisfies us. I had a man one time say, Preacher, come on over to my house. And I was like, I wonder what he wants me to come over. Maybe they got a problem going on over there or something. And I went over to see them, and he goes, Come with me. We went down into his bar. He had a big bar in the, in the basement. He had probably 30 gallons of whiskey and vodka and you name any kind you can think of and he goes I want you to help me pour all this down the drain <laughs> I've never touched it to my lips <laughs> down the drain it went he said what a blessing he goes I don't need that anymore the Lord's all I need. I don't need to come home and, you know, I don't know what they call it. Shut down, cool off, get drunk. I don't know. I don't need that anymore. Jesus satisfies me. Isn't that something? What's it going to take for you to have that powerful presence of the Holy Spirit power in your life are you ready for it? Would you accept it if you asked for it? How many believe if you asked for it, God give it to you? Yeah. What are we waiting for? Let's stand. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.